please welcome back to the stage, Adrian Tremble. All right, let's get down to business this morning. I want to introduce you to three of the most remarkable executives in the NMSDC network. Women of color who have built fulfilling, empowering careers and have a lot to share with us on the subject of success and leadership. Please hold your applause until I introduce all of them and bring them to the stage. First, let's bring out Tiffany Eubank Saunders of Bank of America. Y'all didn't listen. <laughs> Next, Anurada Habar, Global Head of Diversity and Inclusion for Verizon. Y'all still ain't listening. And Amelia Alwalski, Senior Director and General Manager of CHEP Automotive and Industrial Solutions and CHEP Pelican Solutions. Please, the ladies, come out and let's get this discussion started. Okay. Well, good morning, ladies. Good, good morning. morning. Good morning. We have some powerful questions that we want to talk about and share some, some information with the audience today. So let's just talk about it. We understand that women of color are making some tremendous strides in the U.S. today, and we want to talk about how we're getting there and what we need to do to continue moving on. So let's first start with you, Amelia. Let's talk about, as you've grown your career, what challenges have you faced along the way and how have you been able to adjust them, to overcome them, to continue making progress? As I think of my career in general, one of the key areas that was um, probably the biggest hurdle for me was really being comfortable in my own skin, um, was really understanding where I fit in, being myself, being my authentic self. Um, initially, when I first kind of joined the company, I was in a very um, male-centric type of role. Not a lot of females were in that role, and I wanted to fit in, and I realized that I was adjusting too much to what was supposed to be um, what tended to be the norm, right? If all the guys went out to the bar afterwards, I would do it, and that wasn't just who I was. So it was really being comfortable who I was, and, and it, that came through a lot of self-reflection and a lot of just um, networking with other people who had made it to certain levels in their career and understanding what made them successful. Early on in my career, I was lucky enough to have a very senior executive um, woman who had, um, who had been working at the company, and she gave me a lot of actual um, feedback along the way, and, and it really helped me become comfortable with who I was. And once I became comfortable, that confidence naturally exuded, which um, enabled me to be a, a better leader and, and help throughout my career. Excellent, excellent. And we know that as we go along that career journey, particularly as we get to the C-suite, we have more women than ever that have reached the C-suite. But tell me, Anurata, what do you think about women of color who have made it to the C-suite, and how have we been progressing, and what do you see are, are still of our opportunities? So we've made some progress, Adrian, but not enough, right? So the numbers have been flat for like 20 years. Mm -hmm. the, the, the growth has been slow, right? Women of color at the C-suite today are 4%. That's, it's, we're underrepresented significantly in corporate America today at every level. And so I think the challenge for us uh, are we're finally discussing. We haven't had those conversations. Mm -hmm. we've, been, we've been scared to have those conversations. And so I'm delighted that you are actually being deliberate about having these kinds of conversations because it's important. They're not happening in corporate America. And the challenges of women of color uh, aren't discussed or understood, and we don't have enough solutions around them. And so we've got good intentions, but we've got to really create deliberate actions. And so I think, um, for me, I'm excited because right now is our time because of the changes in the workforce. Um, women of color are the largest pool of talent today. Mm -hmm. And if we don't tap into that, we are not gonna be able to achieve our goals as companies. Yeah, exactly. We won't have the talent pool to fulfill those objectives and those goals to actually help carry out the initiatives on behalf of corporations. I saw a study that said that at, the, um, at today's rate, women are graduating from college at a much higher rate than any, women of color are graduating at a higher yes. percentage rate than any other demographic group. And as these folks are coming into corporate America, Tiffany, tell us about how should they be looking for mentors and finding those who can help them come up through the pipeline and, and get to get the type of development that they need for those, those C-level positions? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I agree completely with the comments regarding the fact that the representation still is not there. And unfortunately, the advocacy has not been there as well. And yeah. so to me, the key to success for women of color is to not only identify great mentors who can show you how to do things or 
be a soundboard for you as, you're mig as you are navigating your career and trying to achieve different levels. But also, probably more important, is to find a good sponsor. Yes. And the difference between a mentor and a sponsor is a mentor will tell you how to do things. A sponsor will put you in the positions to do those things. And as women of color, we have traditionally lacked in the sponsorship table. Having someone who is willing to not only advocate for us, but also to hire us into those positions that we know we're, we are capable of, of being in. Mm -hmm. And we, to your point, women of color are the most educated women on earth, literally. <laughs> right. And oftentimes, we are the most underpaid women who are, in the, who are in the workforce. The other thing that I wanted to add, Adrian, is you know, I think as we achieve success in our careers, it is critical for women of color to sponsor other women of color. Yes, absolutely. And to actually reach back and pull up along the way. I often ask my peers, not only at Bank of America, but just minority execu female executives in general, how many women of color are on your team? How many women of color have you helped get to the next level, no matter what the organization that they're part of or what industry they're a part of? And it's un un unfortunately, I'm oftentimes surprised that more have not done what they need to do in order to move, move the progress. Absolutely, and that's a very key point. When you think about it, you know, we have to be able to demonstrate how we support each other yes. in the workplace and actually live that out. So Amelia, tell us a little bit about how do you select mentees? Because obviously you can't mentor everyone. I think about my role when I was at Toyota, I probably had over 25 mentees myself. Yeah. But you know, if, if, unfortunately if there had been more of me, it wouldn't have to have probably have been so many for me to actually handle. Right. What do you do to find those mentees and to select them and help develop them? Yeah, so typically the way I kind of go about it is it's, um, it, there's a couple of qualities that I look for. It has to be someone who's really wanting to have that time, right? Because time for the mentee and for yourself is very valuable. And you want to make sure that you're giving all of yourself to that mentee. So if you don't have the right amount of time, you don't want to make sure you don't overcommit. But it's really about that hunger, the curiosity, kind of really kind of being, putting themselves out there to make sure that you know that they're really in it. Um, and those are some of the key areas. Other than that, you kind of look at teams that sometimes have um, just very few people that maybe you can feel like they can relate to, and really building that network to understand where those areas of gaps are, and where you can help, whether it's being a sponsor or a mentor. Because in some cases, it's really about being a sponsor, um, to the earlier point pointed out. So as we think about having those mentors and sponsors in the organization, as you mentioned earlier, making sure that you are being sponsored by someone. I always tell folks, you want to know, you want to have someone inside that room that is that's speaking right. on your behalf. That's right. It's, it, because that's when the real conversations happen, when the right. doors are closed and no one's, you know, they, they have quiet discussions and you have to make sure someone is in there actively advocating for you. That's, that's right. right. Anya Rada, tell us about how important do you think it is that we have allies that don't look like us? Mm -hmm. It's critical. We're not going to make it otherwise, right? So we're 4%, right? And entry into the Fortune 500 is 17%. We are significantly underrepresented and it starts really early. And so we see the biggest gaps actually early in women's careers and being promoted to first level managers. That's where it's happening and we've got to be able to deal with that very intentionally. The pay gap starts in the first job, right? And so we have to build coalitions um, of support and you need a squad. Right, you, you really do. And, and it's really important for women, particularly women of color. Um, you need to be able to be intentional about who's on your squad yeah. and be able to tap into that squad because it's so easy to exit at, at so many points in your career. And so you've got to be able to have people that actually support you, that are nurturing you and developing you. Mentorship is not sufficient for advancement. Right. We have got to understand that. You have to have a sponsor, you've got to have a board of advisors. I say you need Sam in your life, right? I need a sponsor, I need advisors, and I need mentoring. You need all three, and you need to be intentional about developing that. Yeah. And so 
it's not gonna happen otherwise. And so we've got to build relationships across lines of difference. And that's hard. It's hard for women of color. It's particularly hard um, for, for black women because that's what the research shows, right? We're not getting, right. black women are not getting mentored. They're not getting sponsored in particular, all women of color, but particularly black women. And, and that's a problem because we're not building those relationships with men, with white men, with who are at the table, right? Um, as well as um, white women. Um, and, and that's what we have to do. We have to be able to navigate that social system, build those relationships, and, and really be able to, um, you know, Develop advocate. Yeah, yeah. A advocate for each other yeah. across these lines of difference. It's not enough to just support women of color yeah. that are coming after us. I mean, we have to be deliberate. The men in this room need to be deliberate. Right. The men in this room need to be deliberate. To be able to support <laughs> other women, yes. as do white women. Yeah. And yes. that's how change is going to happen. And it needs to be intentional. And I encourage everyone in this room to identify someone who is around you that is different from you and be intentional about mentoring and sponsoring that person. But let's be that. clear, let's be clear. I want to make sure that we leave this room today with every woman of color who's listening understanding that the burden will be yours. Mm. If you sit back and wait for someone who's in a position of leadership who's not like you, who's not where you're, who's, who is not from where you're from, who doesn't share your experience to reach out to you and try to pull you up, it's highly likely it will never happen. Right. And so you have to be the person to reach out and have those conversations, establish those relationships. So Adrian, a couple of years ago, I was interviewed for a study that was done called, um, well, it was, a, it, was, it was on the heels of a survey that miraculously showed the world, in particular, particularly in the US, showed the fact that women of color, and particularly black women, had very different career objectives than our white women female counterparts. Now, we all know that that's the case, but for some reason that shocked a lot of people. Got a lot of attention, led to a study, a white paper that was done, where they interviewed black female executives and ask them, why is there such a disparity? And why is the ceiling still unbreakable? And what I said in, when I was being interviewed for that study was the fact that I don't believe in most instances, and let me underscore most, I don't believe in mo most instances that um, prejudice is malicious. I believe it comes from a lack of understanding a lack of awareness, and quite candidly, a lack of un unintentional biases that people don't even realize that they have. And, and what I said was the reality is, uh, as I was rising in my personal career at Bank of America, every level I would move to, the room would get smaller, it would become more male, and it would become more white. And what I had to step back and realize at a certain point was many of my white male counterparts were not dissing me or they weren't shunning me. They just weren't used to me being at the table with them. Because when I talked to most of them, their experience with black women had been domesticates in their life. Someone who either, you know, clean their house or, or cook for their family or maybe have even babysat them. But they weren't used to someone like me sitting at the table and having equal say and input. And for them, that was a little bit shocking. So it was up to me to break that barrier down mm -hmm. and show them that I can exist and deliver value, drive the same level of value, if not more, as they do day to day but I had to take the first step in establishing those relationships. The other thing I wanted to say is, as it relates to us helping one another, we have got to be unapologetic about the fact that we are black, Latino, Hispanic, Asian, whatever our race is, we've gotta be unapologetic about it. 
It's who we are. It's right. how we were born. And we've got to start supporting one another in much more visible ways. So for example, at Bank of America, one of the things that I started a couple of years ago after I had finished um, some pretty significant cancer treatment in Baltimore, Maryland, which is not where I'm from, but I was attending Johns Hopkins for my treatment. And what I realized during that time is I had all these fabulous women of color and more specifically black women who would reach out to me while I was there. And, and what was common about them all is they were killing it in their job. I mean, these women were adding value day in and day out. They were holding their own, they were leading, but they were isolated. And nobody knew what they were doing. And they weren't communicating with each other. So one of the things I did th they, at that point was I created what we now call, well, it, originally it was called Black Women Ready to Lead. And we did a day of women's empowerment. And we invited, we went, of course we, you know, I'm smart enough to know I gotta include HR. So I leveraged <laughs> my HR partners, we pulled together a day of empowerment, and it, was it had nothing to do with business. It was about talking about those challenges. Right. It was about talking about the things that are important to black women. Now since then, that very simple act on my part has actually grown at Bank of America. And it's held all over the country over the last couple of years and thousands of black, Latino, and Asian women have gone through that program, have, have gotten together for days of empowerment on the bank's dime, during the bank's time, unapologetically to say we matter and we need to support one another. So I would encourage, actually I challenge every woman of color in this audience and in this room today, if you don't have that type of forum or format in your organization and you know that you need it, start one. And if you need help, you can reach out to me. I'm sure you can reach out to any of the panelists and you can reach out to Adrian to learn how to get that started because we have to do better for ourselves before we can expect other people to want to do better for us. And I Absolutely. think, Tiffany, though, we've got employee resource groups that can provide that support for us, which I think is important at the core, right? But I think the challenge is how do we create workplaces? Because women of color are showing up with ambition and aspiration, mm -hmm. right? They want higher paying jobs. They're asking for bigger jobs, right? We are not lacking in right. aspiration or ambition. The challenge is how do we create workplaces that really foster a place of belonging, right, for everybody, which really is inclusion? Mm -hmm. And how do we create more elasticity around difference in how we show up as leaders? And that is the real work that we need to do. Um, we are there in numbers, we're represented at the bottom, but we are not ascending. <laughs> that has been the conversation for many, many years now. And it's not about fixing women. It's not about fixing women of color. It's about creating workplaces right. that are inclusive where we can thrive. And that is what we need to do yes. um, in corporate America today. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, this is a movement, right? This is like any other movement. While it may not be fair that certain things are a certain way, we know where we're at. Everyone in this room, everyone who's achieved a certain level, we have to make a concerted effort That's to help lift the folks yeah. who are not there yet. And then for the future generations, there'll be other movements, but this is the movement that we have today, and we have to all really, really work hard at it, yep. whether it's fair or not. Absolutely. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is why NMSDC is bringing back its Women of Color Initiative, because this is going to be the future of our pipeline and how we are going to help develop our leaders within the network. So thank you all. Please give these ladies a round of applause for sharing their insights and reflections today. This in itself could be a whole topic of discussion, could be a yes. whole session for us. So I just, I'm just, we just gave you just a little bit to tease with today, but be on the lookout in 2020. We'll be coming back with much more dynamic discussions around this topic. Thank you all so much. We're gonna to move to the next part of our program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please welcome back to the stage, our MC, Angela S. Williams. Thank you, Adrian, and thank you to those amazing women who did a fantastic job this morning sharing with you about the women of color. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, 
please give a warm welcome to the Senior Vice President and Head of Supplier Diversity, Regina Haywood, who is here to make a special presentation. Well, good morning. I am so excited to be here. I'm Regina Hayward, Senior Vice President and Head of Supplier Diversity at Wells Fargo. When people ask me what I do for a living, and I let them know that I'm a supplier diversity executive, they usually follow with another question. Supplier diversity, tell me about that. And I often say that supplier diversity is a profession of people who advocate for and influence on behalf of the multicultural, multidimensional, intersectional businesses that fuel our economy. I say it's a profession of dedicated folks who are not afraid to speak up, to ensure inclusion across corporate America. It's because of people like you in this room today who are the change agents who create the business case, defend the budget, write the story, tweet the highlight, and most of all, nurture the dreams of diverse owned businesses across this country that we're here today. I'm gonna ask if you are a supplier diversity professional, please stand up so we can celebrate you this morning. Let's see all the supplier diversity professionals across the room. Thank you, thank you for being the difference makers. As we gather at the National Minority Supplier Development Council Conference, we celebrate an organization that has been advocating for the advancement of minority-owned businesses since 1972. An organization that works with corporate America in an unwavering commitment to develop and grow minority-owned businesses. It's fitting that this year's conference is in Atlanta, Georgia, a city that has led the civil rights movement and brought forth leaders like Martin Luther King and Maynard Jackson, who were pioneers for economic justice for minority businesses. With over 20 million diverse-owned businesses in the United States, we all know the pace of change that's happening across corporate America. And I believe that change presents a unique opportunity for minority-owned businesses to contribute. Wells Fargo is proud to be a major contributor to the economic prosperity and growth of diverse owned businesses. In 2018, we spent more than $1.36 billion with diverse suppliers, representing 11.7% of our controllable spend. And this marks the fifth consecutive year of over a billion dollars spent with diverse suppliers, many of whom are in this room. Let's give it up for our MBEs. As I look out and I think about the Hispanic, African American, Asian, and Native American businesses who are partners in our supply chain, I know that together we are creating impact. Together we are changing lives. Together we are creating jobs. Minority owned businesses like Apple One, ATR, Diversant, Accurate Construction, Muse, Ascento, and so many more. To continue to have momentum in our spin growth, we know that we have to invest in capacity building in minority-owned businesses. We know that technology and digitization and innovation, cybersecurity, all present opportunities within our supply chain. That's why each year, Wells Fargo invests more than $3 million in diverse business capacity building. Our partners include Dartmouth, through the Tuck School of Business, Stanford, the Latino Business Action Network program, Million Women Mentors, where we're investing in women in STEM, and so many more through the diverse chambers of commerce. Working with small and diverse businesses is one of the most important things that we do at Wells Fargo. In fact, this year, the Wells Fargo Foundation introduced its new strategic objectives, affordable housing, financial health and wellness, small business growth and vitality. I wanna share with you that in 2015, we launched a program called Diverse Community Capital. That program was intended to ensure that access to capital was available to small and diverse businesses. 
Through this program, we have committed over $115 million in grants and capital to community development financial institutions, serving 37 states, the District of Columbia, and Puerto Rico. Our diverse community capital program is in collaboration with the Opportunity Finance Network. And to date, DCC awardees have made loans to over 16,000 small, diverse-owned businesses. Let's give it up for that tangible solution to access to capital. Through 2020, we've committed to provide $175 million of additional capital through the Diverse Community Capital Program. So, today, let us remember that we are difference makers. As we go into the trade fair and we begin to meet and greet and form those contractual relationships, it's very important that we keep at the forefront of our minds the impact and the change that we can make. Last year, I announced that Wells Fargo was collaborating with NMSDC on a minority business development program where in which we would provide funding for 30 minority business enterprises between revenues of one to five million in three locations. And I know these regions are represented because I told you I was gonna call you out. The capital region, anybody from the DC area in the house? Thank you. Houston, Houston, Texas, that was one of our pilot regions. All right, Houston's in the house. And Southern California, anybody from that Southern California area here? Well, we provided $100,000 for the initial program in 2019, and I am proud to announce, let's see if we can get a little drum roll on the tables here as I give you guys this new figure. Wells Fargo is gonna take it to the next level. We're gonna put more capital into the program going into 2020, and we're going to fund $180,000 for the Minority Business Development Program. So let's give it up for that commitment. And in addition, for any regional affiliates who are here, we're also going to launch a regional affiliate micro-grant program. We understand that it's important for the regional affiliates to have access to capital in order to fuel these small and diverse business growth programs. So that's going to be a part of our continued commitment to NMSTC in 2020. So with all this excitement, there's only one way that I could think of to culminate our relationship with NMSTC, and it's with the coveted Wells Fargo Pony Bridget being presented to Adrian Trimble, president of NMSDC. Let's give it up for Adrian and Bridget. The Wells Fargo Pony. Thank you so much, Adrian, for allowing us to be a partner within this network. Aww. How special. Here, Can you hold it? It's I know, big, right? Heavy. I think it's big as me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody, enjoy your day. Please welcome back to the stage our MC, Angela S. Williams. Let's give it up again for Wells Fargo. At this morning's breakfast, you will be meeting both of our MBE conference co chairs. Take a moment to watch the video about one of our MBE co-chair sponsors, Amicus. Greetings, my name is Anne Ramakumaran and I'm the founder and CEO of Amicus, a global business and a technology consulting and staff augmentation firm headquartered in Chantilly, Virginia, with six customer support offices in the U.S., global delivery centers, and innovation labs. For over 15 years, we continue to bring positive impact in the lives of our commercial, federal, and state and local, as well as nonprofit customers. With a global workforce of over 1,200 employees, we continue to provide services around digital transformation, infrastructure modernization, cybersecurity, testing and IBM Reed, and staff augmentation. We're thrilled to be one of the co-chairs this year for the National Minority Supply Development Council's National Conference in Atlanta. For all the MBEs out there, take advantage of all that NMSTC has to offer. And to all the corporate members out there, thank you very much for all that you do and for the continued support. And for all that you do for the diverse business communities. For the emerging entrepreneurs, 
who can template it, whether to get certified or not, I would say now is the time. March forward, get certified, be engaged, be active, take advantage of all that NMSTC has to offer and learn more from the Emerging Young Entrepreneur Program. It's a great program, I must say that. You would learn a little more about that by one of our mentees, Teresa, Managing Partner of the ABCD Company. Hello everyone, my name is Teresa Moore and I am Managing Partner and Chief Marketing Officer at the ABCD and Company. We are a marketing and events firm located in Rockville, Maryland. We leverage technology, a national network of suppliers, MBEs such as yourselves, and cross-functional teams to help our clients better connect and communicate to their internal and external stakeholders. I am so honored to share with you my experience as a class of 2018 graduate of the I program. I can personally speak to the transformation and impact that this program has had on our business. In fact, since participating in the I program, our company is now a certified MBE and has experienced 100% growth in our revenue since the exception of our program. How do we get there? We got there through mentors such as Ann. We got there through collaboration and innovative solutions with our clients. And we got there through the cohort collaboration and the meaningful relationships with our peers. We now are able to prime contracts across industries from financial services, healthcare associations, and many more. We are proud to support organizations and continue to collaborate and find innovative solutions. I'm excited and I look forward to seeing each and every one of you October 13th through the 16th in Atlanta, Georgia at the National Minority Supplier Development Conference. All roads lead to Atlanta, Georgia. See you there. Please welcome from Amcus, Ms. Ann Ramakumaran. Good morning, Atlanta. Good morning, good morning, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the National Minority Supply Development Council's 2019 Annual Conference and Business Opportunity Exchange Breakfast. My name is Ann Ramakumaran, and I'm the founder and CEO of AMPIS, a global business and a technology consulting and a human capital management company headquartered in Chantilly, Virginia. Thrilled to be a repeat co-chair this year at this annual conference. Ladies and gentlemen, are you all ready? I was walking the trade floor yesterday and I'm thrilled and excited to see the commitment of members of corporate America, agencies and nonprofits. On behalf of AMCIS and on behalf of the MBE business community, I would like to express our gratitude and say thank you to NMSDC and thank you to members of corporate America, agencies and nonprofit for your commitment and most importantly, for all that you do for the diverse business community. MBEs, are you ready with your 30 second elevated pitch? Sip that coffee up there, drink a lot of water, be ready, march forward, and most importantly, continue to make some great contacts and connections because those connections and contacts are truly gonna lead to contracts. And most importantly, continue to build that trust and build that relationship because that's gonna go a long way. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I hope each one of you have a fabulous conference, most importantly, a productive conference, and I hope each one of you, all the very best, continued success, and good health. God bless all, and God bless America. Thank you all. Please welcome back the NMSDC President and CEO, Adrian Tremble. All right, we are ready for the second half of our fireside chat. And I wanna be able to introduce to you these powerhouse women who have built billion dollar enterprises. The first, person that I will introduce is Nina Vaca, Chair and CEO of Pinnacle. Come on out, Nina. Give a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. 
And our second speaker, Phyllis Newhouse, founder and CEO of Extreme Solutions and founder of Shoulder Up. Come on out, Phyllis. Okay, as we said, we could spend a whole day talking about the impact <laughs> that women of color make in this U.S. economy, either through the boardroom, through the corporate environment, or through the marketplace. We want to talk to you about the efforts that you're making in the marketplace. I'm going to start with you, Phyllis. As you talk about getting your business started, tell us what were some of the challenges that you faced and how did you overcome them to, make, to get to where you are today? Well, I'll start by... First of all, just saying a good morning, and I'm so excited to be here. And, you know, when I first started a business, I uh, had 20 years in the military. I retired from the Army, and so I, I stepped out of the military, and I thought, well, guys, you know, I've got this great leadership uh, training, and I've done this for 22 years, and, boy, I walked out and had a rude awakening of what uh, starting a business was all about. And the first, I would say the biggest challenge I had was knowledge and, 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 and how uh, to scale the business and how to do it uh, with not a lot of capital. And that was the first wake up call I had. And I think the second thing I would say was one of the biggest challenge was in cybersecurity, um, the talent pool was not there. And, and I kept thinking, wow, how are we gonna build a workforce that doesn't even exist? And so that was the, I would say the two biggest challenges I had was knowledge and the capital and the talent. So Nina, thinking about that, you have been recognized as one of the fastest growing Latina businesses in the country. Let's give it up for that. She's actually one of the, the uh, Inc. 500, fastest growing. Tell us what propelled that growth and how could you, just share what were some of the challenges that you overcame to get there? Small personal privilege. I have great respect for people who have served our country. This woman has served our country. Thank you. So I answer your question, I may be the founder of Pinnacle. Um, I take the credit for being the founder, but I do not take the credit for the company we have become. Today, Pinnacle is a powerhouse. We are one of the fastest and largest growing Latina-owned businesses in this country, but the credit doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the men and women who believed in me, believed in us, and believed that we can build a business. So many of them are here today. I'd be remiss if I didn't say, um, congratulations, Jessica Narvaez, Sandy Mundy, and Allison Lehman, some of the top women uh, who are here with us today. Can you help me give them an applause? <laughs> to answer your question specifically, um, I am an immigrant. Uh, my mother and father immigrated to this country uh, in the 1960s with a suitcase and a dream. In the last 23 years, I have overcome more challenges than I care to talk about. <laughs> I have been through the proverbial ringer in almost every way, access to capital, um, technology channels, education channels, uh, challenges in almost every area of the business you can possibly think of. Too little business, too much business, almost going out of business. I mean, we, got, we even threw me to scandal in there. I mean, we've got everything that we have. Um, we've overcome so many storms and one thing is true today. From the living room floor of my apartment, one thing is true, and that is that when you have a struggle and when you have a challenge and when you're down, you have a decision to make whether you're gonna stay there or not. And that decision is always, hell no. I'm <laughs> proud to say that, and uh, thank you. <laughs> so in the last 23 years, um, I'm proud to say that here we are, loud and proud, um, overcoming and weathering every single business challenge one can think of. And I hope each and every one of you understand that as you're building your businesses, you're going to go through those challenges. If it didn't happen now, it'll happen later. I want you to brace yourself. And when that happens, I want you to think about one thing. Remember who you are. And if that doesn't work, remember whose daughter you are. Lean in and fight hard. Thank you, thank you for that. You know, as we talk about, you mentioned something around the resources that you had to have um, to help you really get you know, access to capital, things of that nature. And I heard a quote yesterday from our uh, board chair, uh, Dr. Frida Lewis Hall, that's really stuck with me, and I thought about it all night. 
and that is when things seem out of reach, move closer. So if you, t if you think about the resources that we need to really help us get to the next level, to help us scale, help us grow as, as women entrepreneurs, Phyllis, tell us, what do you see as those resources that are available and what more do we need to make sure that we have the ability to scale and grow? Well, I'm gonna, I'll share a personal story um, with you guys. Um, you know, when I first, I was about five years into business, um, you know, I, I hit that kind of a bump in the road and, you know, I had grown a little bit and then I would start beginning to scale and, uh, and, and then all of a sudden that, that fear set in. It, it was like, oh, wow, you're going to start losing revenue. You go, what if you lose this contract? And the fear began to set in. And someone introduced me to Janice Bryant Howroy mm -hmm. and uh, she said, hey, you, you got to meet this friend of mine. You, you remind me of Janice. And I said, well, who is that? And she goes, you don't know her? She's one of the largest African-American-owned women businesses. And I said, okay, I'll meet her. And um, she said, uh, but do your homework on her. Because if you do your homework, you will find that she will be a, a, become a great strategic partner. Not a mentor, not a coach, but a very strategic partner. And so I would tell you this, that meeting was a game changer for me because I, will honestly tell you, had she not taken the time and sowed a seed into my life and into my business and gave me the access to all the resources that I did not have. I didn't have um, a great corporate attorney. I didn't have a great CFO at the time. I didn't have strategic planning. Uh, you know, and, and Janice sat me down and said, look, you know, I, I see where you're going but you're gonna need women like me on this journey. And you're gonna need women like me to roll up my sleeves with you. And so, and I, and I said, well, I'm not as big as you. I'm not at your level. And one of the things that she said to me, we were born at the same level. Only you have decided that you're not at this level. When you make that decision, you will scale your business and you'll quit setting limits. And so the resources that she provided and, and, I, and I have to say this, I met Nina not even two years after I met Janice. And now think about that. I mean, Janice Halcroyd and here's Nina. This is where I am today. <laughs> Resources. Absolutely. And that's a powerful, powerful story because you're right. We have to, as we talked about, support each other, be resources to each other, help provide access to each other's networks. As we think about it, Nina, and I have to say this again because I have a little bit of privilege here, Let's congratulate Nina on becoming part of the 2019 class of Corporate Plus. Billion dollar enterprise here, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, Nina, outstanding. But we know that you serve on a number of boards, corporate boards, and we have studies that show us that there, some corporations have set targets for women to be on their boards around 20, 25% by certain timelines, but we see that women of color are still lagging behind in terms of being appointed to those boards. Tell us how you've been able to maneuver through that type of situation to get on public boards and what advice do you have for other entrepreneurs particularly who have the P&L experience, who have the, the experience of running successful businesses, get positioned to, for those corporate board assignments. So scale is the answer. When people, when it, it, I serve on a couple of publicly traded companies and I often find that they're looking for people, yes, that run a large scale, a large P&L, but they're also looking with people who have a large breadth of experience and growing a company from the ground up, as I said, takes a lot of experience, mm -hmm. um, alliances with other companies. I think the NMSBC is a perfect feeder for the boardroom, and I'll tell you why. I have incredible respect for people in corporate America, women of color who have grown their careers there. Ladies, it is such a challenge. You heard it with the panel earlier. McKinsey came out with a report, uh, in particular about Latinas, but I can apply it to all women of color. Mm -hmm. And the McKinsey report said that Latinas are the 1% of the corporate boardroom. Not only the 1% of the corporate boardroom, they're also the 1% of the C-suite, the 1% of the senior vice presidents, the 1% of the vice presidents, the one, and it goes on and on and on. And so um, if you're interested in the report, I tweeted it out this morning. I was privileged uh, to be able to be part of McKinsey's Latino Economic Forum. But women of color, whether it's African American, Hispanic, or Asian, are in that same challenge. And so getting to the C-suite and then getting to the board, we gotta get them to the C-suite first. And the way we get them to the C-suite 
is scale. The answer is scale, which is why I'm so excited about the Corporate Plus program, because women and minority-owned businesses, particularly women of color, they can grow enterprises and become and create more C-suite executives. Today, 66 of Pinnacle's headquarters are women in the most powerful positions, our controller, our chief diversity officer, our chief of staff, our head of fundraising, our head of sales. We have so many incredible women and so I feel like scale is the answer to your question, because if you don't have the breadth of experience, the large P&L, and the NMSTC can be an incredible feeder to the corporate boardroom. Awesome. And I think it's too, Nina, to your point, recommendations. A lot of times women will get recommend, can recommend That's other right. women. And, and I had a friend of mine um, who was um, interviewing for um, a position with the NFL on one of the women on the board of the NFL, and she knew that it was a conflict of interest, and she reached out to several women in the network and said, I want to recommend you. She didn't just turn the position down and the opportunity, she put that opportunity back out to the network, and I think a lot of times we have the power to change history, mm -hmm. and we don't exercise that power because we say it's not for me, then I'm not gonna do anything. When something comes your way, we have a responsibility to take that opportunity and share it and give it away to somebody else. Wow, I'll tell you, again, this is why NMSTC is bringing back its Women of Color Initiative, because this can, again, be a whole separate day for conversation. But we know that folks are going to start moving out to head to the trade show floor, so we're going to wrap up here. I want to thank you, ladies. Thank you. Let's give them a round of applause for sharing just a little bit of nuggets <laughs> and insights with us. And as we continue to get ready for the rest of the program, we're going to move right along. So, but thank you, ladies. Thank you so much. <laughs>